Greetings and welcome back to 303. We are now turning in our hymnals to page 49, and we are working now with the Beowulf epic, and more particularly now, this passage that will be titled, The Battle with Grendel. Let's go ahead and put it in our notes right away at level one. Anytime you have an adventure story of any type, you have to have that moment when you will have the great contest, the great fight, the great battle. Go ahead and jot down really quickly at 3A. What is your favorite movie, your favorite video game, your favorite TV show where you have a great battle, you have a monumental fight, right? That is to say, a contest of some kind or another. What is that one for you? Many, if not most, of those scenes are predicated and built on the one we're about to look at. This is one of those, one of those more famous in literature, one of those famous moments when you're going to have these two go at it. Who are the two? Let's put it in our notes. Beowulf, obviously the hero of our Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf, and the monster Grendel. Now you'll remember in the preceding reading that Beowulf will have asked King Hrothgar, the king of the Danes, can I fight Grendel? Can I fight Grendel alone with just a few of my warriors? Can I fight Grendel alone and no armor and no sword? Which sounds as if he's stacking the deck against him, right? Beowulf has some, some confidence, we might say, in his ability. I'm with you now on page 49. Again, just to remind, I really do challenge you. Try and read along with me. Don't just listen to my reading, but try and read along with me. Develop your skill sets as a reader, okay? And, of course, we'll periodically pause to be working at level one, and then obviously two and three to follow. The Battle with Grendel. Page 49, line 285. Out from the marsh, from the foot of misty hills and bogs, bearing God's hatred, Grendel came, hoping to kill anyone he could trap on this trip to High Herat. He moved quickly through the cloudy night, up from his swampland, sliding silently toward that gold-shining hall. He had visited Rothgar's home before, knew the way, but never before nor after that night found Herat defended so firmly his reception so harsh. Let's pause for a moment and point out for your notes at 2B. This is what we call foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. Write it down at 2B. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing simply means that the poet is going to tip his or her hand and tell you, uh-oh, something is coming. And we're told that Grendel comes to Herat Hall, but never before or after will he have the kind of reception he's about to have. Which gives, of course, the Listener, remember this was an oral poem long before it was a written poem, and of course the reader, some idea, something good's about to happen in terms of a good fight, right? Line 295, Grendel. He journeyed, forever joyless, straight to the door, then snapped it open, tore its iron fasteners with a touch, and rushed angrily over the threshold. He throws open the door. He strode quickly across the inlaid floor, snarling and fierce. His eyes gleamed in the darkness, burned with a gruesome light. Then he stopped, seeing the hall crowded with sleeping warriors, stuffed with rows of young soldiers resting together, and his heart laughed. He relished the sight, intended to tear the life from those bodies by morning. The monster's mind was hot with the thought of food and the feasting his belly would soon no. In other words, he walks into the room, he sees all the sleeping soldiers, and we're told that he laughs because he knows, I'm about to jack me a whole bunch of soldier meat. I'm going to kill all these soldiers. I'm going to eat every one of them. Yay. But notice the F word. And the F word in the Anglo-Saxon poem, Beowulf, is the word fate, destiny that from which you cannot turn away, right? Fate will have determined something different for Grendel. Let's take a look. Line 309. But fate that night intended Grendel to gnaw the broken bones of his last human supper. Human eyes were watching his evil steps, waiting to see his swift, hard claws. Grendel snatched at the first geed he came to, ripped them apart, cut his body to bits with powerful jaws, drank the blood from his veins, and bolted him down, hands and feet. Death and Grindel's great teeth came together, snapping life shut. 
Now, some have pointed out, whoa, this is pretty violent stuff. You got a monster that just tears apart the body of, this, of these soldiers he's eating and gulps them down. Very violent monster. Then he stepped to another, line two thir uh, 320. Then he stepped to another still body, clutched at Beowulf with his claws, grasped at a strong-hearted, wakeful sleeper, and was instantly seized himself, claws bent back, as Beowulf leaned up on one arm. Uh-oh, let's write it in our notes at level one. Grendel comes in and kills one of the sleeping warriors, but notice Beowulf, he doesn't sleep. This will be a key motif in literature, the idea that the best warriors are the ones who remain awake, right? Remain awake. And so Beowulf is not asleep. That is to say he is always, what's the Boy Scout model? Be what? Prepared. He's always prepared. And notice Beowulf will seize, that means grab hold of, Grendel. So we're going to have this famous moment. Often it will be called grappling. For those of you who know anything about wrestling, you know that it's sometimes referred to as grappling, that back and forth with hand-to-hand -hand combat. All right, here we go now, the battle with Grendel, uh, line 325 on page 49. That shepherd of evil, guardian of crime, knew at once that nowhere on earth had he met a man whose hands were harder, his mind was flooded with fear, but nothing could take his talions and himself from that tight, hard grip. Let's just pause for a moment and point out, we are working now at the top of page 50, that the moment Beowulf grabs hold of Grendel, Grendel knows it's over. Grendel knows it's over. He, we're told the, the, the monster never knew a man to have such tremendous hand strength, all right? Grendel's one thought, top of page 50, Grendel's one thought was to run from Beowulf, flee back to his march, and hide there. This was a different Herod than the hall he had emptied. In other words, the monster's only interest is to try and get away. Notice when he cannot win, the monster wants to run away, right? That's funny thing about bullies, funny thing about bad guys, funny thing about villains. When you stand up to them often, their first instincts are to run away. And here Grendel wants to get away, but Beowulf will not let him go. Beowulf will grab hold and not let go, right? Notice, but Heigelech's follower remembered his final boast and standing erect, stopped the monster's flight, fastened those claws in his fist till they cracked, clutched Grendel closer. The infamous killer fought for his freedom, wanting no flesh but retreat, desiring nothing but escape. His claws had been caught. He was trapped. That trip to Herat was a miserable journey for the writhing monster. Notice the word writhing is a vocabulary word. That is to say twisting in pain. So now all of a sudden, no, notice the shoes on the other foot, isn't it? Now Beowulf is going to give to Grendel a little bit of pain and all Grendel wants to do is to try to get away. All right, here we are now on page 50, line 343. The high hall rang, its roof boards swayed, and Danes shook with terror. Down the aisles the battle swept, angry and wild. Herod trembled. Imagine for a moment a fight in which the gym of our school physically moves because the people inside are fighting. Imagine a fight like that. Imagine a contest at a football stadium where the Literally, the stadium begins to rock back and forth because of the contest that's happening down on the field. This is, of course, what we will call exaggeration, won't we, right? So we're going to have an exaggerated, even kind of hyperbolic type of story where they fight so hard that literally the walls move and the roof moves of the Herat Hall as we've got this fighting that goes on. I'm with you now on 345. Uh, Herat trembled, wonderfully built to withstand the blows, the struggling great bodies beating at its beautiful walls, shaped and fastened with iron inside and out artfully worked. The building stood firm. Its benches rattled, fell to the ground, gold-covered boards grating as Grendel and Beowulf battled across them. Hrothgar's wise men had fashioned Herat to stand 
forever. Only fire they had planned could shatter what such skill had put together. Swallow in hot flames such splendor of, iron, of ivory and iron and wood. Suddenly the sounds changed. The Danes started in new terror, crowing in their beds as the terrible screams of the almighty enemy sang in the darkness. The horrible shrieks of pain and defeat. The tears tore out of Grendel's taunt throat. Hell's captive caught in the arms of him, who of all the men on earth was the strongest. Let's point out two things here. Notice, the hall is built so well that when they built it, they said the only thing that will ever tear this down is if it catches on fire because it's made out of wood. But all of a sudden, they get really worried that the collapse, the, the hall's going to collapse because of the fighting that's going on. right? And then secondly, let's point out, Grendel starts shrieking crying in pain, begging to be let go by Beowulf because he is now afraid. Of course, Beowulf refuses. All right, here we go. Let's now finish this passage up. That mighty protector of men meant to hold the monster till its life leaped out, knowing the fiend was no use to anyone in Denmark. All of Beowulf's band had jumped from their beds, ancestral swords raised and ready, determined to protect their prince if they could. Let's point out, Notice, the warriors who are with Beowulf are now ready to get awake and to help Beowulf to try to beat Grendel, to defeat Grendel. Their courage was great, but all wasted. They could hack at Grendel from every side, trying to open a path for his evil soul, but their points could not hurt him. The sharpest and hardest iron could not scratch at his skin. I'm at the top of page 51. For that sin-stained demon had bewitched all men's weapons, laid spells that blunted every mortal man's blade. Let's pause for a moment and point out, Grendel is a monster who also has magic. So in other words, he doesn't just have right strength, but he also has magic power. And part of his magic power is no blade can hurt him. Note then that it's interesting Beowulf had already said, I'm going to fight Grendel, but without what? Any kind of weapons. Notice that when they try and use weapons on Grendel, it wouldn't have mattered anyway, right? We'll keep going. I'm on page 51, line uh, 379. And yet, Grendel's time had come. His time had come. His days were over. His death near. Down to hell he would go, swept groaning and helpless to the waiting hands of still worse fiends. Now he discovered, once the afflictor of men, tormentor of their days, what it meant to feud with almighty God. Let's just pause for a moment and point out that in the Anglo-Saxon poem, Grendel is being killed not by Beowulf, but he's fighting against, what did you just read? He's fighting against almighty God. In other words, God is on Beowulf's side in our poem. Right? Okay, it's a deeply theological poem. And the idea from the Anglo Saxon code is if God is on your side, you will win. This is a very ancient notion that when you go to war, you use God as your defense. You claim deity as on your side, and therefore, predetermined the fate is that you will win. In other words, it's inevitable that Beowulf is going to win this. Why? Because God is on Beowulf's side. Back to, uh, to line 385. Grendel saw that his strength was deserting him, his claws bound fast, Hygelic's brave follower tearing at his hands. The monster's hatred rose higher, but his power had gone. He twisted in pain, and the bleeding sinews deep in his shoulder snapped. Muscle and bone split and broke. Woo, let's write this down at level one. We have at the end, Beowulf holding on to Grendel's arm, Grendel pulling away, and from out of the socket of his arm will be pulled his arm. The monster will lose his arm, not then his life. The monster will get away, and Beowulf will hold on to the arm as a trophy. We'll talk about that here in a moment. The battle was over. I'm again on page 51, line 393. The battle was over. Beowulf had been granted new, and there's our G word again, glory. Grendel escaped, but wounded as he was, could flee to his den, his miserable hole at the bottom of the marsh, only to die, to wait for the end of all his days. 
And after that bloody combat, the Danes laughed with delight. He who had come to them from across the sea, bold and strong-minded, had driven affliction off, purged Herod clean. He was happy now with that night's fierce work. The Danes had been served as he boasted he'd served them. Beowulf, a prince of the Geats, had killed Grendel, ended the grief, the sorrow, the suffering forced on Rothgar's helpless people by a bloodthirsty fiend. No Dane doubted the victory, for the proof hanging high from the rafters where Beowulf had hung it was the monster's arm, claw, and shoulder, and all. Now, some of us live in houses where on the wall hangs a dead animal head or a stuffed dead fish. And some of us have been in houses where we see this. And the obvious question is, by people often who are unfamiliar with this kind of culture, why would you kill an, an elk stuff its head and stick it on a wall? And the answer, of course, is it's a trophy. What does that mean, trophy? Well, it allows for individuals to remember an event. This idea goes way, way back in time. After Beowulf kills Grendel by tearing off his arm, Beowulf takes the arm of Grendel and hangs it in the rafters, that huge arm, hangs it in the rafters of Herat Hall. In other words, every time the people see that arm, they will remember the great battle between warrior and, of course, you know, the, the terrible monster. Okay? Now let's finish up. <clears throat> of course, we could, uh, let's work annotations for just a second now. Of course, we can already begin now to identify at level 2A some major messages and themes. Let's write down a couple of them. One obvious message theme is that in the end, the good guy wins. One of the old ideas is that in the end, the good guy wins. Beowulf will win because God is on his side and because Beowulf is stronger. It is fated that Grendel will therefore lose. That is to say, not only will the good guy win, but the bad guy will lose. The monster will lose. Notice how, at 3A, notice how we play that game in most of our movies, in most of our TV shows, in most of our video games. The understanding is, sooner or later, the good guy wins, the bad guy loses. That optimism or hope is buried within the text itself. In other words, even when things are really bad and Grendel is there, there's going to be the death of Grendel at some point. Okay, So that's a first and a major message for us. Number two, notice that we will have the fulfillment of the boast. Beowulf said he would do something, and then he does it. The idea here is central to the Anglo-Saxon code. If you say it, you do it. Now, some of you were raised in houses where you were told this. Don't make a promise unless you plan on keeping that promise. If you say you're going to do something, then do it. Of course, the idea to follow this is, if you say you're going to do something and then you don't do it, then you cannot be considered heroic. Finally, notice the G word. Beowulf himself will say, I want glory. I want to be remembered. Now, of course, you can walk into any high school and you can walk up and look in trophy cases, and there are photographs of single individuals cut out in our school in a trophy case. These are athletes who are celebrated, selected out from the rest of the team, which begs an obvious question. Could any of those athletes have made it into the trophy case alone? And of course, the obvious answer is, no way. They, for example, had to be born first, which means two people, of course, produced them. They had to be raised. They had to be coached all the way through. How is it possible that we select out one individual, take a photograph of that individual, and then put it in the trophy case? Of course, this takes us back to the Anglo-Saxon idea. You've got to have your Beowulf. You've got to have your leader. You've got to have your hero that will then be celebrated above all the other ones. Good idea or a bad idea? 
This is, of course, going to be a muchly debated topic, isn't it? Some high schools, for example, will take a photograph of the entire team. But still, quite honestly, that still doesn't encompass all of the people involved in producing that athlete. Would you agree with me? The parents, all of the younger coaches when the athlete was small. And yet, we still like to do this thing where we call out someone or a group of someone, and we will call them heroic in some way. Let's now jump to 3B. And our final question here. Do you think Beowulf is heroic? Do you see him as a hero? And if so, why? What makes him heroic? Is it that he overcomes his fear? Is it that he actually accomplishes what he set out to accomplish? Of course, another analog question to this, and one we'll have to come back to several times in our conversations about Beowulf is, what are your thoughts about heroes? Do we have heroes today in our culture, like the Beowulf hero? Or have we kind of lived beyond this? And what about the student who said, I am my own hero? Interesting comment. Good idea or a bad idea? Would Beowulf had agreed with the notion of calling himself a hero? Notice he never calls himself a hero. He lets other people call him a hero. Does Beowulf know he's a hero, though? Does he get it? And is that the real reason? He will say that he did this because he had a duty, but in the end, is it really about his, his being a hero? And is that pride? Wait a minute. To be a hero, do you have to have pride? And is pride a good thing or a bad thing? We're asking a number of very thought-provoking questions. Well, keep reading. Thank you for your kind attention.